Welcome to this edition of the Wireless News Desk for June the 5th, 2020. And we have three things that I want to talk about today in this video. First of all, V2X, vehicle to everything. This is a moving trend gaining more and more popularity and interest as people are looking forward to more vehicular automation. Assisted driving, of course, is first. We've already seen some of that. And fully autonomous driving is coming. When? Well, that is yet to be determined. But in order for it to work, we need really solid and stable communication options from the vehicles to the infrastructure, to other vehicles, to and from pedestrians, and so forth. For example, you don't want an autonomous car being fully aware of the road that it's on and the other cars that are on the road, but not being aware of a pedestrian that's crossing the road, right? So we need all of this to work. And of course, there are different methods of accomplishing this. Part of it is that the pedestrian has a mobile phone on them or some other communicative device on them that is able to communicate with the vehicle in some way. Obviously, privacy information has to be maintained and so forth, but that could happen. Obviously, though, we live in a real world and there are going to be animals and pedestrians that do not have any kind of communicative device on them and the vehicle needs to be able to sense that as well. So there will be sensing technologies built into the vehicle. I shared in the past the reality that Intel predicts terabytes worth of data coming out of these cars in the future. So very, very important to have V2X communications. Well, I found it interesting to note that the debate has gotten very, very hot between two technologies. And the two technologies are listed here in this article reported at coalofduty.com. The V2X vehicle to everything communications, ecosystem key trends, key players, business models, and market size forecast till 2030. And of course, this is based on a report, but they're giving some information that's in the report without revealing the whole thing. And one of the key things that you'll notice as you go down the list here is right here, DSRC, dedicated short range communications, and CV2X, cellular V2X. So DSRC is effectively what is implemented in 802.11p. If you're not familiar with 802.11p or you've never really looked at it, paying close attention to that amendment shows that it made modifications to the OFDM5, as well as, of course, Mac and, and other areas to allow it to work. And what it allows then is for uh, 2DS from DS, 00, zero value for non-BSS communications. So it's not an independent basic service set and it's not an infrastructure basic service set. It's an outside of the context of BSS communication or an OCB communication. And 802.11p defined that to use OFDM, to use effectively 802.11a. And this works up in the, the top end of the 5 gigahertz band in the 5.9 gigahertz area. Uh, there is, if I remember right, 75 megahertz or so of bandwidth there for utilization with this kind of communication. So that's 11p DSRC. The 3GPP has also put forth CV2X. So this is, of course, a cellular-based technology. And this is one that's ready to go for the future, obviously, as cellular continues to evolve. The difference between them has been shown in many, many studies and actual tests of implementations that CV2X tends to be more stable and reliable than 11P. It tends to perform better than 11P. And there are many reasons for that. We're not going to get into that today. But I do want to point out that even with that, this report, remember, is released very recently. And notice what we see here. With an initial focus on road safety and traffic efficiency applications, Toyota and GM, General Motors, have already equipped some of their vehicle models with 11P-based V2X technology in Japan and North America. Among other commercial commitments, Volkswagen will begin deploying 11P on volume models in Europe starting from 2019. Geely and Ford, however, plan to integrate CV2X in their new vehicles. It's also worth noting that a number of luxury automakers, BMW, Daimler, Volkswagen subsidiary, Audi, and Volvo cars, already deliver some kind of V2X type application through wide area cellular connectivity. So they're using cellular, but it's not necessarily CV2X. So again, there's this ongoing debate. 
the industry is growing. Here's the thing. The first thing people think of is when they hear um, CV2X versus 11P or DSRC is what happens when you've got some cars that are 11P and some that are CV2X? I mean, are they going to be able to communicate with each other? Well, certainly not using those technologies, right? If those are the only technologies they support. But remember that much of the communication is really about communicating with the infrastructure. And so we don't necessarily need the cars to communicate with each other in the context of sending frames back and forth with each other. Although obviously that would be beneficial. But here's something to know. And that is that some of the newer chipset makers are saying, why go one way or the other? And they're building chipsets that can do both DSRC and CVTX. So when you implement that in an automobile, you get both of them. And you can use either of them. You can use both of them. Of course, it's going to depend on the chipset, whether it has to be switched from one mode to the other, or whether it has effectively two radios to do both communications at the same time. Over time, I expect to see evolution in that area where vehicles will have support for both and possibly both of them concurrently. So we'll see how that unfolds, but it's something to watch. 11P has been around for a long time. The concept of DSRC has been around for even longer before it was implemented in 802.11. So we'll see. I don't think there's going to be a winner here. I think we're going to see both of them continue to be used for their different purposes. The second thing in the news today, Windows 10 2004. Microsoft launched it in late May. And one of the key things is that it supports Wi-Fi 6 and WPA3. Now, I do want to back up because I say the new Windows versions in a way that can be confusing. I said Windows 10 2004. <laughs> this is not the year 2004 version. This is version 2004 of Windows 10. So it'll be the latest update. It's rolling out in stages. Wi-Fi 6 and WPA3 built right in. I'm not going to say any more about it just the news. There you have it. Here's the final thing I want to share with you today. This was exciting to me when I saw this because the four gigabyte barrier has always been a problem for me with maker boards. And finally, we have an eight gigabyte Raspberry Pi version. So Raspberry Pi 4, uh, the only difference you can now get an eight gigabyte version. It still uses the same processor. It still has the same 11 AC wireless built in. It still has the same gigabit ethernet, USB ports, all the rest, all the other stuff is the same, but there's an eight gigabyte model that is available. Now the folks at raspberrypi.org have said that the reason for the delay has been getting an eight gigabyte uh, LPDDR4 memory module that would work for them with their board. And so they do have that now. It is in production and most places are out of stock at the time that I'm recording this, but I'm sure you'll see the stock come in. I've placed my order. I'm waiting for the stock to come in. So this is nice. Eight gigabytes of RAM means that you can do a lot more, particularly with virtualization. I know that might seem odd doing virtualization on a Raspberry Pi, but it has plenty of power to do it, particularly if you want to virtualize different OVAs, different virtual machines that are appliance type implementations. They're very small in footprint. Maybe they only need 512 megabytes of RAM or less to run and not a lot of processing power. Then that means that I can run three or four of those easily on a Raspberry Pi in some type of a scenario where I want to build out something like that. It also means I can more easily build more capable things like uh, LoRa gateways for LoRaWANs and other technologies that can be run on top of Raspberry Pi. And it means I've got more memory to be able to handle greater workload. It means that I can build better edge compute into my IoT maker type devices or even though I'm saying maker, it could be for production in a large organization where we just need 20 or 30 IoT devices that do a particular thing and we want to do a lot of edge processing. And that extra four gigabyte of RAM can really help with that. So exciting news. And I'm sure many of you will be placing your orders. Well, thank you for viewing and I'll see you next time with the Wireless News Desk.